Greetings, beloveds. My name is Candace Simpson, and I greet you in the name of Christ the Revolutionary. We welcome all our international faith leaders who are from South Africa and Palestine, Ghana and England. And I also want to shout out everyone from Brooklyn. Had to do that. We welcome you. If there's anything that we can do to make your time with us more accessible and suitable to your specific needs, please do let us know. We also invite you to visit the chapel in the Mbongi Proctor community at your leisure. Welcome into this place. It is so good to see your names on the right hand side of this chat and it's good to see, oh, I'm seeing people saying hello um, already. Um, it's good to see you in the way that we're able. If I may, I'd like to just acknowledge the weight and the strangeness of us all sitting and looking at our devices. In another universe, we might be strolling late from dinner with friends into the worship space or sending friend requests, catching up with people we haven't seen from last year, finding each other in the lobby, complimenting each other on the mud cloth that we spent a good deal of money on in the lobby that we purchased from <laughs> vendors. But this year, we acknowledge the hundreds of thousands of lives that have been lost due to this virus. This week, we hit the tragic milestone of nearly a half a million lives gone. And that's just in this nation and those are just the ones that we know about, just the ones that have been counted officially. I do not say this to sadden you before the worship moment or to disappoint you, but to remind you that there is a reason why we gather, why we must gather. We are here to worship a God who can hold all of what we're feeling in this moment. So if you are thankful, 
to be alive. There is room for you here. If you are angry at your electeds, there is room for you. If you are grieving a loved one, there is room. If you're looking for a word, there is room for you. If you are embarrassed to feel what you are feeling and you don't yet have words for it, there's absolutely room for you. Christ tells us, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. In other words, beloveds, friends, comrades, kindred, sit down and rest a little while. We welcome you and we got you family. We do not all start at the same scratch line, although there's one original position hypothetically for everybody. You were born here owning nothing, having earned nothing, just born. There you are helpless and you are debtor to everybody. But some of us opened our eyes and saw nothing but blessings just dumping on us. I opened my eyes and there was Herbert and Velma and my grandma Hattie a slave in Chesterfield County who finished Hampton in 1882, smiling on me. How in the world could I lose? Taught me how to read and sing four-part harmony before I ever got to school. Taught me how to play the clarinet and the piano. Made me go to Sunday school. Daddy didn't send us. Daddy took us to Sunday school. If there was nobody in the Sunday school but one person, that would have been my daddy with his little six children there in the Sunday school at the Bank Street back. That's what I inherited. I didn't earn it. You can't get that with a Visa card. It was given to me. Now all through my neighborhood there were other young fellas. I can remember all of them. Daddies were drunk half the time. They didn't read in their homes. Nobody went to Sunday school. None of that. They started life beneath the scratch line. I started life way above the scratch line. Everywhere I went, somebody said, aren't you Miss Hattie's grandson? Are you Herbert's boy? Skip three grades. I never was in the third grade, the fifth grade, or the seventh grade. Everything smiling on me. Finished high school at 15, went on to college on a scholarship. None of that did I deserve. I hadn't earned any of it. I started out with a head of steam. Old North Mission College there had trained my mother and father. They had learned poetry, Paul Lawrence done by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And they gave all of that to us in great abundance. And my buddies up the street had none of that. Now, if we want these bones to live again, those of us who have inherited benefits that we did not earn or deserve, need to turn around and help those who inherited deficits that they did not earn or deserve, and help them to rise up to the scratch line where we are, where we are. Black people never come together for worship without being mindful of their liberation theme. They're always aware of the uh, imperfect uh, status that they enjoy in this country. And every time they come together, there is some consciousness of this. It would be a mistake, however, to think that all during the worship service, that's what they had in mind because they do have a connection with the larger human community, the larger Christian community. And if you listen to the music and the prayers, you will hear uh, reflections of that. Uh, I'm so proud that black people never, never were locked into a kind of a narrow 
conservatism, a narrow fundamentalism that excluded other people. Uh, we never had that. As a matter of fact, uh, we've been trained in different seminaries, we've gone to different universities, and uh, there's quite a bit of difference in formal theological positions. But the one thing that binds uh, the black uh, Christians together is uh, their history, their sojourn, uh, their, 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 their experience socially here in this country. And that's, uh, that's the bond, and they never come together to worship without that being recognized and without their faith being celebrated. But I grew up in a house that was built by my grandfather who was a contractor. He and Mr. Stoney and Mr. Big John Smith would take Hampton Institute students and have them in Norfolk on an internship, and they built scores of houses in Huntersville. And the house still stands there, 918 Fremont Street, built by young black students from Hampton under the supervision of my grandfather. I was born and reared in that house. It was built in 1919. And today, it does not lean to one side. The roof is still on it. It's still there. And black folk built it. They did all the plastering, all the plumbing work, all of the electrical work. And we've got young black folk today who talk about black people have to get out here and go into business. I wonder where you've been. My vegetable man was black. The ice man was black. The tailor was black. No white man touched my life until I left home except to sell my daddy a used automobile. Imagine that. The dentist was black. The mortician was black. Everybody I dealt with was black, so I grew up believing that black folk could do anything. <laughs> See, I was here a while ago when Jeremiah was scratching his head, wondering how things were going to work out to finish this ambitious program. But you know, there's a phrase in the Bible said, and lo, it came to pass. You remember that phrase? Lo, it came to pass. See, some folk don't appreciate that. Because some folk are always stirring around, stirring around, and don't make nothing come to pass. <laughs> you know folk like that. Busy all the time, and nothing comes to pass. But the Bible has a phrase that says, uh-huh, uh-huh. After all of that wiggling and sweating, something came to pass. Something has come to pass right here. Oh, yes. And you know why? It's because God is able God can move obstacles out of the way. God is able. If it's God's cause, you can't stop it. And if in your life you're trying hard to turn your ashes into beauty, God is on your side. God is on your side. I'm going to take three or four minutes off my sermon because I want to hear you sing, Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burden down. Now, Jeremiah. Thank you. family. Glory, glory, hallelujah. That was the last sermon that Dr. Proctor preached, and now we are here gathered celebrating his centennial birthday. Happy birthday, Dr. Proctor. We hope that as you look down, you, you know that we have gathered in your name now for these 18 years, and we are not an event. We are not an annual gathering, but we are a 24-7 ministry walking in your footsteps, praising you and thanking you for the ways in which you have left us your legacy to emulate. And it is with that then that we're not gonna talk much tonight, we're just gonna share what it is that we have been doing for the last 12 months as a 24 seven ministry, a ministry for those who are committed to serve the God that you served. Happy birthday, Dr. Proctor.
In response to the multiple pandemics Black America faced in 2020, we pivoted to a virtual space. Salbona, to continue our outreach to you, our clergy and lay leaders who struggle mightily in the vineyard. Every morning at 7, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, we began a daily prayer service that elevates the petition of prayer warriors from around the world and of all ages. An online pastoral counseling call hub and peer conversations around the identity of being called and black. In partnership with the Tuskegee National Bioethics Center, Tuskegee University, we established an interdisciplinary bioethics commission on COVID, continuing to bring information and ministry resources to our community. And in the midst of the pandemic, we joined others at the United Nations protesting the trauma Black America is facing from medical apartheid, protracted racialized state violence, which is a part of our collective memory, and the historic events like the George Floyd murder, the Elaine Massacre, and the Tulsa Massacre. But truth crushed to the earth shall rise. Bring in a couple of guests here. Uh, Reverend Dr. Iva Carruthers, General Secretary, Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. How can we call a system just that willfully refuses to know the truth. Today I, I pray that our minds have been filled with knowledge and information that will burn inside of us that we desire to do better than what has been done. And my remarks are brief <coughs> and it will include only three words. Give it back. Yeah. Thank you. So we continued our strong presence in the sacred demand for reparations and HR 40 with the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee. With faith, we kept on moving, working with the Black Church Pack as we distributed thousands of free masks and hand sanitizer to our communities. We hit the streets in 10 states with our Wyatt Lucy census and get out the vote training and mobilization. And we're proud of our work on power to the polls that led to a now Senator, Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock, and the efforts to celebrate our victories included our growing ministry to protect the environment and ensure water security. Security. Believing in the power of prayer and worship anyhow, our trustees joined national leaders in prayers for the nation. Our young people initiated Fourth Fridays and Third Thursday Thirst for Worship and produced a remix of video casts on what makes you so strong, black man, and how are the children. And like our namesake, who embraced his African identity. Reverend Dr. Mama Iva was honored to accept an appointment to the International Board of the Pan-African Heritage Museum in Ghana, West Africa. This year, we honor eight fierce defenders of our faith. Reverend Dr. Wendell Anthony, Reverend Dr. Anthony Bennett, Dr. Dolores Brisbane, Reverend Dr. Lawrence Carter, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III, Reverend Joanne Watson, Reverend Tracy Blackman, and Bishop William Barber. I'm so grateful that there is in this world something called the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. You've been on the wall doing the work. Sister Iva Carruthers and so many others, they are friends of mine for so long. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for your prayers. Now let's move our feet. Keep the faith and keep looking up.
And the people of God said, Amen. Well, thank you so very much for your prayer. And I'm grateful for the prayers of the people of God. I have felt them over the last several months as we uh, decided to engage and in a real sense felt called and summoned uh, to continue to expand the circles of our democracy. And now because of your prayers, I said as only the 11th black senator in the history of our country. We've come a long way, but God knows we have a long way to go. And that's why I'm so grateful for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. You represent the best of our faith. You represent the faith of the black church, the conscience of the American churches. I'm grateful to uh, the Reverend Dr. James Forbes, who was a professor at Union Seminary during my time there as a seminary student. He has both informed and inspired uh, my work as a preacher in the public square. I'm grateful for John Meacham for the ways in which he captures the American story and most recently tells the story of our brother and my parishioner, the late great Congressman John Lewis. John Lewis, like so many others in our faith tradition, is a product of the faith of an enslaved people. Howard Thurman said, by some amazing but vastly creative spirituality, the slave undertook the redemption of a religion that the master had profaned in his, in his midst. In other words, our folk weren't simply converted to Christianity, they converted to faith, intended to make them docile and obedient, and transformed it in the American context into a liberating faith. That faith gave birth to the likes of Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer, so many others. It is the faith that John Lewis took with him across a bridge in Selma and created a bridge to the future that extended the promise of democracy to future generations. That fight continues in the United States Senate. It continues in the Capitol. It continues in the work that I am committed to doing in the days ahead. So thank you for your prayers. Let's keep praying. Praying with our lips to be sure, but also praying with our legs. The Ghanaian proverb says, when you pray, move your feet. And so let's keep our feet moving until everyone has access to affordable health care, till we defend the dignity of work, and until we renew the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and other legislative tools that will strengthen and secure the right to vote because our vote is our voice. Our voice is our human dignity. I'm so grateful that there is in this world something called the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. You've been on the wall doing the work. Sister Iva Carruthers and so many others, they are friends of mine for so long. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for your prayers. Now let's move our feet, keep the faith, and keep looking up. Good evening. How proud I am and to take this opportunity to invite you to give and to support the Proctor Conference, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. As we suffer from COVID overload and quarantine fatigue and even isolation exhaustion, I pray that God will touch each of us to be able to give tonight to help support the struggle. I am thankful to direct you to Givelify and look for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor space and then to even go to the app, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor app, and then look for Give and contribute, invest. Look for that and then give. May God's richest blessings be upon you as we empower ourselves to liberate ourselves. God bless. I am humbled and honored 
to give a brief introduction to a brilliant man whose introduction could take up to an hour and a half. From the hills of West Virginia to the halls of Ivy in New York City, a dual PhD in philosophical theology from Union Theological Seminary in New York and Columbia. Dr. John Kenny has a mind like no other mind I've ever encountered in the academy or in the church. He is one of the first generation of Cone scholars earning his PhD under James Cone who never left the church. I don't know if it's his love for learning or his love for the church. It makes me love him so much or his love for his family. I've lost track of the number of grandchildren he has. He and Tina have raised a family that's incredible while never giving up on the academy and never giving up on the church. Pouring his mind, his skills and his gifts back into the black community for over four decades now, Dr. Kennedy, the first Dean Emeritus of the Samuel Dewey Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union, after having held that position for the longest in the history of the school, is still the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Beaver Dam, Virginia. Those of you who have come to Proctor, Proctor family, you know what you're about to hear after the sermonic selection. I thank God that more than a scholar, more than a pastor, more than a husband, more than a father, more than a grandfather, Dr. John Kenny, known affectionately as Billy to his family, is my friend. Hear ye him. Have to come and read ministers to us. Tragedies are commonplace. All kinds of diseases. People are slipping away. The economy's down and people can't get enough pay. But as for me, all I can say is, Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. You know, we realize that there are folks without homes, people out in the streets, and the drug habits, some say, they just can't be. There are muggers and robbers. No place seems to be safe. But you've been my protection. Every step up, every step up the way. So I just have to say, Lord, thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Because it could have been me outdoors with no food and absolutely no clothes all left alone without one friend or just another number with a tragic end. No, 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 no. But you didn't see fit to let none of these things be. And every day by your power, you keep on keeping me. So 
I just have to say, Lord, thank you, Lord. I know we're virtual, but thank you, Lord, because it could have been another way. But thank you, Lord, because you keep me in my right mind. Thank you, Lord. You're keeping me from all danger, seen and unseen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for all you've done for me. Our God is an awesome God. And I thank this awesome God for the many ways that we receive evidence of God's continued investment in creation. I thank God for the opportunity that is mine now. I thank this Proctor Conference for their continued work and fidelity to every effort to bring knowledge, understanding, and just practice to our churches in our communities. I could call the role of so many names that are a part of this moment of fellowship that have blessed my life in amazing ways, but my time is relatively short and I would spend the whole time just saying thank you. But let me just say thank you to all of you. I am often both affirmed and chided from time to time for those who would say that when I teach, I teach with the passion of a preacher. And when I preach, I preach with the content of a teacher. Well, I want to confess to you tonight that I am going uh, to honor both of those suggestions. And I'm going to violate the dictates of the specification for homiletical precision. Because I'm going to say much more than you would want to say in one sermon. But I want to share what I say with a level of passion about where we are as a people, as a church, and as a nation. Before I start, let me just say a word about our theme, holy rage and holy hope and this whole issue of moving toward uh, being transformative agents and moving toward a transformed future. Many people have a problem with the word rage, but if you, if you look at it, it uh, a rage in its deepest level just means intensity of focus and purpose. There is ra holy rage. Rage is modified by the word holy, and so holy uh, Make places a requirement on the character of our intensity. Then we talk about holy hope because rage without a vision will become fatalistic and cynical. But hope without rage will become esoteric and disembodied. Here we are combining holy rage, holy intensity, with holy hope, with holy vision. Rage without hope becomes empty, fatalistic, and cynical. Hope without rage becomes esoteric, sentimental, and disembodied. As these two elements of fidelity to God converge in this moment, I want to suggest there is a biblical narrative that helps us understand rage and hope linked together. And I would call your attention to the 21st chapter of Matthew that describes what has been called the, hist the triumphal entry. It's paralleled in the other Gospels, and we will 
make some reference to it, but I want to zero in on the 21st chapter of Matthew in the 10th verse where you find these words in part A of the text. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was moved or the whole city was in an uproar. I want to share the thought, a seismic event, and if you wanted to extend it, characterized by seismic protest and seismic praise. My prayer is that I might be faithful with this moment and might be a partner with God in the achievement of God's purpose in this hour. God never gives moment and opportunity without purpose. So in every moment, we seek to honor the purpose so that God could see us as partners in purpose. This is our prayer, God. Anoint and touch as only you can anoint and touch. A seismic event extended, we extended, characterized by seismic praise and protest. The word translated move in the King James, uproar in the Good News Bible, comes from a Greek word from which we get seismology, seismography, seismologists. The word literally means shaking, vibrating, and literally an earthquake. So what the Bible just told us when, 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 when praise and protest meet, and praise is authentic. The environs in which that praise occurs creates an uproar in the city. It shakes up the reality. It disturbs the normalcy of the condition of existence and begins to vibrate and create a stir in the midst of what was once settled question might be is then is what we do on Sunday morning really praise because there are those who would want to maintain the normalcy of alienation who rejoice when we go to church and praise because they recognize there is no transformative quaking power that emerges from thy praise and the question becomes why not and the question also is raised is it really praise if we look at this text for a moment, I'm going to throw out seven things. And normally, you know, I'm a three-point sermon with a conclusion. But I want to throw out seven things. Here they are. We first experience the presence. The presence leads to seismic praise. You encounter the resistant element to the praise in the priest. Then you have a series of protests communicated and articulated by Jesus that ends up with a model for a praxis of ministry that engenders more praise, and I want to suggestively indicate it ends with prayer. You see the presence, the praise, the priest, the protest, the praxis, the praise, and the prayer. Walk with me for a moment. First of all, in this moment, in the pilgrimage of Jesus through time, it reaches a point where Jesus is no longer going to be a, pa a passive observer, where he is no longer trying to maintain some form of secret or distance so he can reach the point of the fulfillment of his ministry. No longer will he resist any affirmation or elevation such that that elevation might disrupt the design that was destined for him in the work that he was called to do. But in this moment, 
Jesus manifest the presence of God in a powerful, significant way as he throw down, throws down the gauntlet before the powers of this world. In other words, in this moment, Jesus is saying the time is now. It is time for me to step into this reality with absolute clarity and affirm that there is power here that's not like your power and that I will celebrate and embrace the fact that other perps people will begin to recognize the power is in the presence of the Christ and not in the power of the potentates and the power of his day. In other words, Jesus rise, rides in and affirms a presence that is counter world, counter world not only by having the audacity to present oneself as one who is worthy of praise, elevation, and affirmation over against those who are presently positioned for praise, the way he comes in, riding upon a, donk a donkey, refutes and undermines the behavior that, is, that has been normalized by those who are in charge let's go back first of all I'm here and I'm here affirming that I have authority and I claim a presence that transcends what you've been doing and the way you're acting so I ride in throwing down the gauntlet and giving evidence to an embodied threat to your power and not only that, the way I ride in redefines the operative character of power and undermines your profession and claim to be the real witness of the nature of power because I come in. I come in in a way that's not in harmony with the way you think I ought to do it. It's not in harmony with your design. It does not follow your tutelage, your guidelines, your structures, and even your training on how someone who got power walks, talks, and acts. Because my coming in is not an act of arrogance affirming your modality, but I dare to come in. I come in in a style that affirms authority does not have to act like you act. There's much that could be said about that, but note I was said, I can only do this suggestively. So in the very way when he comes in, he comes in, can I suggest to you? He comes in praising God and glorifying God by the character of his entrance. And the character of his entrance is an implied protest to the powers of this world both implied and real, I come in with some praise glorifying God and with an embodied existence that's a protest against the reality you affirm and embody. Look what happens. When this presence is in the place, praise breaks out. Praise authentically is expressed when the presence is in the place. Notice two things about the praise. It is directed and devoted to God and that which embodies God and not to an individual, a party, a group. It is not a response to the praise team. It's not a response to the preacher, but it is a response to the presence. Come on. Seismic praise is never the sound of responding to a performance. It is the overflow compelled by an encounter with a presence. In other words, when the presence is in the house, praise will be directed to God. And anybody who wants the praise to be directed at them is the one in the text who is threatened and attacks authentic praise because it's directed at God and not to the glorification of them. Stay with me. Here it is. The presence comes in, praises come forth. The praise is initiated, inspired, and compelled by the presence, not by a performer. This praise 
becomes seismic. This praise is a new form of protest. That the way that I protest the authority of all of those who claim to rule over me and to claim to be the necessity for my well-being, all of those who dictate to me who I am and how I act, all of them who want me to bow down and to give, to give authority and glory to them, when Jesus comes in, Jesus usurps their authority and I take praise away from them and begin to raise it to God. Authentic praise is devoted and directed to God and the revelation of God that's embodied in him who represents God. But the praise is not only directed and devoted, it is diverse. When praise is authentically a function of the presence, we don't all praise the same way. Look at the text. Some threw their coats down. Others pulled down branches. Read all of the different parallel narratives. Some in front, some in back. So what the Bible just told you, when the praise is size, size, seismic, not everybody in the praise movement will praise in the same way. Some will pull down branches. Some will lay their coats. Some will be in front. Some will be in back. And one of the clear evidences of oppression in worship is when everybody is contextually coerced to worship in a conformed fashion. Stay with me. In other words, can I say this, family? Oftentimes in the black church where we talk about freedom, in worship we put people in chains because we dictate the character of the praise and establish what's authentic and inauthentic. Can I make it plain? Here's somebody in church. Some folk are up shouting and running. And then here's somebody who condemns the people who are sitting there with a tear in their eye. What am I trying to tell you? When the presence is in the house, not everybody will respond to that presence in the exact same way. And if everybody is judged and forced to conform to a unified common of response to the presence, that is a new form of oppression, even if it's in the black church. And I do not judge, condemn, or diminish somebody because when I'm shouting and running, they're sitting there quietly rocking from side to side. Not only will it be diverse in expression, in different people, it may be diverse in expression in the same person giving the manner in which they are having an existential experience of the presence. The same person who ran last week may just sit there with their head down this week. That does not mean they have stepped away from praise. It means that they have an authentic moment of praise engendered by the presence and not by your compulsion. Here's what I'm going to say. That praise that is seismic is given to God, and it is diverse. But the next thing that we discover in the text, particularly when we bring in the Luca narrative, is that whenever there is authentic praise, the folk in power get mad. Look what happens. It's not clear in Matthew, but if you look in the Luca narrative, the priest... The priests who represent the power systems operative in the church, but also in the politic. Whenever people start praising God instead of them, and their praise gives rise to a, a behavior that does not glorify those in charge, immediately those in charge get mad. And then they try to use a biblical theological argument to justify their madness and to stop the people from praising. You all didn't hear me. Not only do I control the situation, I control the interpretation of God. And therefore, anytime you don't do or act the way I want you to act and do, then I turn to my power to control the interpretation of God to not only say that you're different, but I can establish that you're in fact ungodly. And I will even tell Jesus, 
how Jesus ought to act when street folks start acting up. Come here. Jesus, you ought to tell these folk to shut up. Don't you hear this? Let me quote you this. They should not be acting like this. These people in the street shouldn't be doing this. They shouldn't be doing that. And Jesus, get them straight. And Jesus' response is, if they don't cry out, these rocks will cry out. Here's what I'm trying to say. Anytime there is an authentic embodied praise of God that usurps the authority of those in power and provides an implied or direct critique of those in power and diminishes the glorification of those in power. Those in power get mad, get upset, get angry and begin to establish a rationalization whether it's political or legal but in the religious realm I give you a theological or a textual reason why you shouldn't be doing this when the real issue is not this they're talking about is the fact that your praise undermines their authority so that your praise is actually a form of protest when you can't praise you can't have holy rage and holy hope come on it's a protest now got to move but in the response to that here it is do you see it here's the presence the presence gives rise to praise the praise gives rise to protest by those who are in power the priest but in response to the priest Jesus makes a series of protests now let's look at the series of protests the first protest was when he came in, I protest. I throw down the gauntlet before you. The second protest, I accept praise and give people the authority and the freedom to recognize the power of God that transcends the authority of these earthly powers. Hmm? Now, that's the But the next protest is he protests against the leadership in the church and the community that finds fault with folk being in the street glorifying God in tangible praise. He responds with a protest. Okay, you can find fault with them. But I want to, while you want to condemn them for their praising, I want to praise the folk in the street. I want to praise everybody who has lined up and joined this movement to the degree that they're more committed to God than the systems that you have propagated, constructed, and appropriated. I want to praise them. And if they don't, if they shut up, if they step away from their protest against you and praise God, then the rocks will cry out because embedded in creation is the DNA of God. And if you don't have sense enough to recognize it in the gift of your humanity every other created element has breath in it and let everything that has breath glorify God let me correct you while you are finding fault I affirm them I affirm these people walking in the street as the legitimate praise and the consequence of their praise is seismic in proportion proportion because the city has thrown into an uproar there is an earthquake in the city but then I want to suggest to you there's another leap in protest and it's not forceful but you got to discern it the people in the street said he was a prophet, which was in fact a limitation on the fullness of his character and the completion of his identity and his purpose. So the next protest is the protest against street people. Y'all stay with me. Because the street people start believing that the only way you glorify God is in the street. What Jesus is was did was celebrate the street and then go to church. You miss me. He makes an implied protest of anyone who would limit me to a prophet, a street prophet, and not understand the comprehensive fullness and the depth of what I have come to bring realization to this world. I, yes, I praise you in the street, but can you follow me to church? The problem is that sometimes when we get excited about our service of God, we want to limit the parameters of God's activity to the location of our operation.
That is that sometimes that we can become so right-headed that we become big-headed and we're not big enough to limit our heads to God's head and God's got more and beyond the way we've constructed God and I don't want my, the, my intensity about a particular movement to strip me of a fuller understanding of the depth, power, presence, and promise of God for all creation. And so what Jesus says is, yes, I celebrate the street. I rode into the street. I affirm the street but now let's go to church you see we sometimes create a fracture between the street and the sanctuary what Jesus says that yes I affirm the street and I'm glad he starts there because that may be the place I have to start I have to affirm the people in the street and celebrate with them in the street but I also got to understand that in my profound behavior I still go to church Church has meaning for me. That no, I just don't do it here. I go to the temple. Jesus could have just stayed in the street, just hung in the street. But intentionally and purposely, he went to the temple. And then in the temple, he lodged a protest. Look at this. And I need some street people who recognize who I am and praise me appropriately to still have the depth of wisdom and faith to come out of the street and still function in the church. To go back to the church because I don't want to surrender my church to the negative oppressive powers that have been operative in the street. They're also operative in the church. So I'm going to the church and here's what I'm going to do. I'm not just going to talk about what's going on in the street. I am going to practice a theological alteration and a metanoia of consciousness wherein there's a new existence in my church. If you can see it in the street, why can't you honor it in the church? I need your presence in the church. Come and go with me to the church and celebrate the promise and the possibility of the church. And he went into the church and he said... uh, This is not what God intended this place to be. This is not what God wants in his church. Because you have taken this church and used as an arena where a privileged few take advantage, objectify, and commodify others for the purpose of their own economic interests. So you have structured it in such a way that people come here to be victimized, abused, and used so that you can maintain a position and a privilege. And you have sold your soul and sold your work to someone who will get your money, and you even preach messages about getting money while you are selling stuff in the temple to get money and violating the people who came to worship and you're abusing them and you are operating more like the experience of a plantation than the church come on let me make me you are provide you are embracing a system that is built upon an economy that requires the negation violation abuse and violation of other people so that you can move up and then you not only abuse them you begin to tutor them to how to become a part of the abusers because if you can abuse like I abuse and we abuse I guarantee you you'll move up too so the issue is no longer the transformation it becomes access and participation in a system that will always require victory And so while you're setting some people free, you would say you're enslaving other people even while you have excess, excess, access, visibility, position, and power. But that power is predicated upon the negation of people just like your people were negated and commodified. Jesus makes a protest. Jesus turns it all over. And said this here, here, look, this will be a house of prayer, a house of intimacy, a house of encounter, a house of empowerment, a house of relationship with God. And you've made it into a den of thieves and robbers. You've turned it into a resource for how people can make money to promote themselves and to promote you. But you're not providing the resources that equips them to transcend the system that requires commodification, abuse, and violation. And you're not equipping them to be the agents of transformation or rather than the victims of accommodation. 
turn this stuff over. My house shall be a house of prayer. So, oh, are you saying me? No, I'm not saying you step out of the economy. I'm step, you step out of the practices, the behaviors, and the systems that required victims in order for you to have an economy. And you begin to envision ways of how we cultivate resources, but we do not bury them. We use those resources to engender flourishing for creation in all the earth rather than burying them to promote a privileged few. He makes a protest in the church. And then out of his presence. And see, even after he protests, look, I'm going to show you something. He doesn't protest and say, I'm out of here. I'm through with the church. I got y'all straight and I'm not through with you. No. Once he begins to create a different environment within the temple, he goes to work in the temple. He did not invest and challenge and critique the church to leave it. He invested in the temple so that the temple could be a place of faithful praxis. And look what happens. Look what happens when you can get the temple into the point of being a house of prayer for all people. Look what the text says. Read verses 1 through 17. It said the blind and the cripple came to the temple and he healed them all. Do you see it? Do you see it, family? It means that if I can get this temple focused, I won't have to be worried about folk coming. People will come, and guess who's coming? The very people that you wanted excluded, you didn't feel worthy. The people who had to be on the outer porch, the people who had to be at the door, the excluded, the denied, the diminished, they are now running to the church, running, and they're filling the pews, and the church is full of the people that your system had alienated, denied, destroyed, and walked upon. Now the church is running over. There is no loss of membership because people are flowing into a community of authentic expression of God glorification and guess what happens there we heal folk and don't just think this is physically we heal people from the traumatic stress we heal them from dysfunctional racism we heal them from broken bodies broken minds we heal them of toxified understanding of the Christian story and the meaning of Jesus Christ we heal them from the lies that parade in this earth and then we begin the community of truth that takes truth to a nation that is following the lies and here we have a praxis where the broken are welcome and the power of healing is released life comes to death light to darkness hope to despair joy to sorrow power to weakness and tomorrow's to no ways. In the moment, somehow is embraced in the no way moment. In our praise, the Lord will make a way somehow. And that is not ceding everything to the Lord. It is that I'm so full of the promise and the presence. I will dare to be with holy rage and hope. A witness to God's truth in a season of passivity, quiet, quiescence, despair, and neglect. Here we practice the open arms of an amazing God. Hold them and practice healing with a word to the unloved, love, hmm? to the self-negating, authentic existence and understanding of the self. To those who embrace, uh, embrace the modalities of death for promotion, only bringing more death. Life and life abundantly. There's a praxis, a practice. I'm going to show you again. Look what happens. Whenever the praxis is done, 
there will always be an element in the church just like there was in the street that says, tell them to shut up. Stop what's going on here. Look who's coming. Stop. Do you hear what they're saying? And now you've even got the children messed up because the children, you're healing them and they're growing up praising God instead of me and us. In the same way he did in the street, when those who want to cut praise off, whether it's because you're too powerful or you're still limited in your understanding and the depth, the power, and the promise of praise, haven't you read? These children will bring forth perfect praise. Haven't you read? When you expose these children to the truth, you don't have to coach them to glorify God. You don't just, just let my presence have space and they will praise him. Now, click, click, go back, look quickly. The reason the people, come on, read it. The, the power structure was upset. It's amazing to me. It says the priests were upset because of the wonderful things that were being done. My God, you are in the church mad because something wonderful is happening. You're in the church angry because something wonderful is happening. The blind, the crippled, they're all coming in and they're being healed, they're being restored, they're being raised. And guess what else? And they heard the children praising. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise on children. And guess what it just said to me? That if you don't know how to handle praise, there's a generation raising up who will give forth perfect praise that he will, they will praise God. When the praxis of the presence is performed, the powerful will protest, but even the young will praise and give glory to God. And I think one of the big mistakes that we're making right now, that we're choosing whether we are, we're on the protest side or the praise side. What you just found out in this story, there is seismic praise and seismic protest that go together because your praise is not a, a sign of your passivity. It may be the evidence evidence of your protest. This joy that I have, you didn't give it to me and you can't take it away from me. When I feel like quitting, I all of a sudden, I feel my help coming and I feel like going on. When I think I'm going to stop, the spirit moves me on to keep on fighting. When I feel like I'm going down, I feel the wind beneath my wings and I rise up and I got to shout hallelujah, not because I'm weak, not because I'm illusory, not because I'm in delusion but I got some holy rage and some holy hope and that holy rage and that holy hope links my praise and my protest so don't divide me between the street and the church because in the street I praise in the church I pray in the street I practice in the church I practice don't divide me of who's on this side and that side let me be whole and praise in my protest and protest in my praise and the last thing I would say before I take my seat, I've probably gone over my time already. The last verse, the 17th verse, is simply said, and Jesus left the city and went to Bethany, went somewhere else. Here's my final word, family. If you're going to practice holy rage and holy hope, you're going to catch holy hell. And if you're going to learn how to survive holy hell, you better have some holy intimacy. You better spend some time with God. You may have need to have a life where you get away from the street and the sanctuary, where you have your moments with God and you find yourself refueled, refueled refreshed, inspired, and lifted up. You need to find that place where you can connect with the power of eternity such that it courses through your vein and your body and even when you're catching holy hell for your holy rage and your holy hope there's something you can say I do feel my help coming the presence of the Lord oh hallelujah the spirit of the Lord is upon me and I gotta keep my rage and my hope because the spirit of the Lord is upon me so if you're gonna do really practice this stuff Get ready for your holy hell. 
Folk who even talk about liberation will stand against you. But you spend time with God. Because when you spend time with God, you gain your strength. And well, God will help you understand, even with all that you think you know, you're still a seeker and you're searching. And when you recognize you're a seeker and searching, you will discover that sometimes the issues are in yourself and not them. And so every expression becomes a prayerful confessional moment. Well, I have to acknowledge, God, I'm growing, I'm moving. But God, inspire my rage, inspire my hope. Help me in my hell and grant me moments of intimacy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've told this story many times and I've heard variations of it. You can't tell a story without the story becoming everybody's story. That's the nature of a story. But I've told a couple ways I've told this story. I have, um, uh, I have a lot of grandchildren, y'all, and I, I love them. One of my desires is as a, as a teacher that I will practice inclusion and healing. The left out will find welcome space, even in the academy. And they will find truth that heals the brokenness. And they were empowered to be agents of healing. And I, so I talk to my grandchildren quite a bit. And some of them are really wrestling with Christianity right now. But those young ladies that now and young men, I have a granddaughter named Elise who is now a school teacher. But I can remember when she was my little Elise, Papa's girl. And one of the things I found out as I grew older, all good grandfathers got to be storytellers. So when they were there one time at Christmas, they, they said, Papa, can you tell us a story? Well, see, I don't tell those same old stories. You know, there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a little boy in me that likes to come out and play. And sometimes it plays when I start telling the stories. And I, so I told them the story. And I told them the story about in West Virginia, you got these Bigfoot mountain monsters. You, you know that TV show, Mountain Monsters? Yeah. They're in West Virginia where I grew up. And they're... Nine and ten feet tall, and they're hairy, and they got big tooth, and they drool, and they got red eyes that turn to green, and they go through the neighborhood, and and I was telling them, and they were getting terrified, and so I don't know what was in me, y'all. I started, doing, and I said, guess what? Those West Virginia mountain monsters have moved to Hanover County, Virginia, where you are. And by this time, they're terrified. My grandson now, who just, who, who, you know, who is the man in the gym every day, he was crying. Papa, Papa, no, Papa, Papa, no, 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 you scaring us, Papa, no, no, no. So I had to provide some redemptive element in the story. And I said, but you know what happened? One of the children had the courage to give the monster a sweet, golden, delicious West Virginia apple. When he ate the apple, it was so sweet. He left and went to the North Pole, and now he helps Santa Claus make toys. <sighs> Lo and behold, the next day, they're there at Christmas. They always come by the house. Huh? And here's what, it, Papa, tell us a story again. So I start telling the story and thinking about uh, what they experienced, the trauma when I told it before. They said, tell us, because they could say, no, no, tell us that, tell us the story. I started, tell us that story you told us. I start telling, but because I was being considered, I left the scary part out, all that scary part. I painted a nice picture of, of how it was. And then Elise, in her own little demeanor, this strong little girl stomped her foot and said, Papa, that's not right. That's not how the story goes. 
And I say, what do you mean? This is my story. That's not how the story goes. And I said, and I said, tell us the scary part. And I thought she was trying to terrify her brother again. Tell it all. And it, these, these were his words. Tell her word. Tell us the same old story. Tell us the story. Tell it all. Tell the story that you told us yesterday. And I asked her, are you trying to scare your brother? Why do you want me to say the scary part? She said, Papa, you can handle the scary part when you know how the story ends. And my brothers and sisters, we're going through the scary part again. But with holy rage, holy hope, and holy intimacy, we're going to make it. Through the holy hell. Because I know how the story ends. And I feel a need for some seismic praise. Hallelujah! 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 That my poor soul could not flee. So I say thank you.
circumstances that are black souls that are poor souls that are whole souls could not see greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world we're now going to enter into a time of silence to honor those who have gone on to glory thank you Lord. Father God, thank you for the holy hope that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And Father, as we open up this time, this conference, Father, as we consecrate ourselves before you, we ask that you would teach us how to pray. Lord, you said in the last days you would pour out your spirit, Father, on the young, on the old, that we would have visions and dreams. And Father, yet we come with a childlike faith and stillness asking you to teach us how to pray, to teach us how to make intercession to you, our perfect and holy Father. We thank you for how you've spoken us, spoken to us during this time, O oh Lord. And we ask that you would continue to lead us and guide us in your ways, Father. We ask that you would continue to strengthen us for all that you have for us. Father God, we ask that you would continue to reveal yourself to us, that you would open our eyes of spiritual understanding to discern the things that you would desire for us to lay hold us hold of in this season. Father God, we ask that you would teach us to link arms, Father that you would remind us that we are stronger together, that we are better together, Lord, that we exist in a body, Father God. I thank you for the words of Paul that remind us, Father, that no part of the body is more important than the other because we are in need of each other. Father, how dare the eye be envious of the arm and how dare the leg be envious of the eye, God. Would you teach us, God, even during this time together as we gather to honor each other, to honor the gifts, Father, to to honor the anointings, Father, to honor the body and to honor the diversity of the body in which we live. Father, we thank you that Christ is the head and we ask that you would continue to teach us how to fix our eyes on you and that our intimacy with you would strengthen us for the days that are to come. Father God, we rejoice with a holy celebration, God, for the living hope that we have in Christ Jesus who makes it possible to live in this holy hell. Father, we know how our story ends and we thank Thank you, Father, that our eyes have seen our, the glory of the coming of the Lord, even in the spirit. Father, we thank you that we can rejoice. Father, that even as the world weeps, Father God, we thank you that we can have joy in you. But Lord, even as we have joy, I thank you that that joy is not the absence of suffering, that that joy is not the absence of tears, Father, that the joy is not the absence of our grief. And so, Father, in this season, we ask that you would teach us, Father, how to weep and to rejoice at the same time. Father God, how to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice, Father, that just as Christ Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, 
endured the cross. Would you teach us, Father, how to endure, endure with joy, how to look to you, Father, and have joy, <laughs> how to know, God, how to know that it's from you which cometh our help, and therefore, Father, we can carry on. Father God, teach us to continue to hold on to the vision. I ask, Lord, that during this time that you would release a greater vision for us, Lord, that you would pour out new vision, Father, new vision for our generation, Father, new vision for the generations to come, Father. Would the young sit at the feet of the old and learn, and would the old sit at the feet of the young and learn, Father, and hear the new vision, Father? Would you bring an intergenerational ministry in this season, Father God? Would you teach us how to be dependent on one another, Father, for what you're doing in this season? Would you teach us, Father, how to lean on each other, Father? Would you teach us, Lord, how to fight in the spirit? Would you teach us, Lord, how to intercede the way that you interceded? Jesus, we praise you and we thank you that you are seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue to remind us, Lord, that it's not our perfection, that it's not our perfection, it's not our works that allows us to engage in this work, that just as Peter was one who denied you and yet was one, was one of the greatest apostles in the early church, Lord, would you teach us in the same way, Lord, that even for those of us who may have felt that we have denied you, Father God, in our anger, may have felt that we have denied you, Father, in our doubt, would you remind us Lord, that those moments, Father, are not a, a disqualification for the work that you have for us. Father, we honor you and we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, and we honor you. And we just close with the words of Paul now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God, our savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing we have had tonight. I have waved. I have rocked. I even ran a little bit. And so we can end these this evening with um, our announcements for tonight. And then we'll see you again in the morning. Our first announcement is that we want you to know that normally you'd have a had a program book before we began. But our partner in Dallas was completing our book um, that was completing our book was displaced by events in Texas. And so we want to lift him up in prayer as, as well as all of those who are affected um, by the weather in Texas. But plan to visit our Mbangi network um, tomorrow morning. That's proctor.ministrylife.org. That's proctor.ministrylife, M-I-N-I-S-T-R-E-L-I-F-E dot org proctor.ministrylife.org tomorrow morning in the a.m. to get the addendum of the schedule and bios, which will be available. The full book will be available later Tuesday evening. Secondly, please be advised that go.proctorconference.org, that's go.proctorconference.org, will take you to the attendee hub, which is the doorway to enter the conference. We suggest you bookmark it for easy access. This is where you can go and make changes in your schedule or you can your changes will be confirmed and you'll be you'll be issued the appropriate zoom links to get into um, the conference. Feel free to share this information with others who are registered okay make sure that you don't keep it to yourself. We want to welcome all of our international faith leaders who are from South Africa, Palestine, Ghana, England and across the globe. We also welcome all of our families with special needs. We have made every effort to support your participation in this convening because everybody counts to us. Since the start of this pandemic, we've been praying for our community and our Proctor family. And we hope that you are joining us and being blessed by our daily prayer calls at 7, 10 a.m. Central and 8, 10 a.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday on our social media platforms. That's at Proctor Conference. Join us for our third Thursday Thirsty Worship Service, making, safe, making space for our gifts of our young preachers. You can go to our website at SDB, sdpconference.info for more information. We remember so many of our sheroes and heroes like this past year. We again, just like we did earlier, just a few minutes ago, offer up our special prayers to the families of those who are 
who lost someone to COVID-19. In addition to that, you know, tune in this Sunday at 5 p.m. to 6, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Eastern uh, to the launch of the Progressive Hour on the COVID-19 vaccine. It's a medical and ethical review with the president of a Meharry Medical School, esteemed trustworthy researchers and clergy. The monthly program is a partnership between the Progressive National Baptist Convention and the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. Thank you for supporting our sponsors. They're, they're supporting our sponsors. Their generosity matters. Please, please, please support our exhibitors. Sal Bona, we value and support those who support and value us. And happy birthday to Dr. Proctor. A new generation is on the rise. By his example and in his honor, let's worship in mind and spirit by going to the Proctor 2021 book wall to update our library and knowledge base. Remember, you can visit our Mbongi Proctor community to see video tributes to Dr. Proctor and a fuller version of the film, Walking in Legacy, at, again, proctor.ministrylife, that's M-I-N-I-S-T-R-E-L-I-F-E dot -E org. You can visit the chapel in the Mbongi Proctor community. You can also visit the exhibitors in the Mbongi Proctor community. I'm urging you to go to the Proctor community and just hang out for a while. Make, make it the new health hotel lobby in this 2021 conference, proctor.ministrylife.org. We'll highlight the books of our presenting authors on the book wall where the Proctor Network can find a link to purchase your book. If you want a Zoom room for a meetup with the author conversation, we have scheduled and will announce your room between noon and 2 p.m. on Thursday, February 25th. So please let us know. Look out for Grandma's Hands, hand sanitizer for our families that is owned by a faith-based cooperative, the Boabob Tree. And finally, and this is a Methodist close, just one, registrants. If you need help of any kind at any point in during our conference, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We have staff members ready and waiting to help you. Contact us by phone at 773-548-6657. That's 773-548. 548-6675. I'm gonna say it again because I think I messed it up the first time. 773-548-6675. Or email at conference at sdpconference.info. Again, you need to log into the attendee hub um, to get a link to the registration email to access all the sessions plenary. The downloaded app that you have is just to read only, just to have, help you navigate to it, but you can't make any changes. God bless you, Proctor family. We've been blessed today and I can't wait till tomorrow.